So a little bit about me, although I think Megan said enough, but I'm the owner of Alyssa Livy Nutrition and Wellness LLC, which is a private practice based in Connecticut. My practice specializes in digestive health disorders and specifically we work a lot with irritable bowel syndrome and a little bit about my background on there if you're interested. So the learning objectives for today, participants will be able to identify and describe an overview of the three stages of the low FODMAP diet and for whom the low FODMAP diet is appropriate. Participants will be able to identify contraindications for recommending the low FODMAP diet. Participants will be able to describe different dietary strategies for managing IBS and participants will be able to describe different non-dietary strategies for managing IBS. So to start, why is this topic even important? So IBS is a functional GI disorder, now called Disorders of the Gut-Brain Interaction, or DGBI. It includes a combination of symptoms such as abdominal pain, bloating, altered bowel habit, there are three subtypes. There's IBS constipation predominant, or IBS-C, IBS diarrhea predominant, or IBS-D, and IBS mixed, mixed variety, or IBS-M. Uh, the Rome 4 criteria is currently used for the diagnosis of IBS, and it is important to differentiate between the subtypes because that could also play a role in treatment. Uh, the prevalence of IBS in the United States is estimated to be about 10 to 15 percent of the population, although it's been reported that it's likely much more than that because many people do not get diagnosed. Uh, it's the most common condition diagnosed by gastroenterologists. Quality of life is a big concern when it comes to IBS. So according to the IBS Global Impact Report, Many patients uh, surveyed said they would give up 25% of their life or approximately 15 years to be symptom free. IBS can also reduce work productivity and can have a significant impact on one's social life and relationships. The low FODMAP diet has become the first line dietary therapy for IBS management and it has a reported success rate of 50 to 86% depending on the literature is <laughs> a little bit of a broad range. Um, and so with good reason, it's become a first line therapy. The evidence for the use of the um, low FODMAP diet is mostly with regard to irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, but there is some limited uh, but promising research supporting the use of the low FODMAP diet in some other conditions, in particular in inflammatory bowel disease or IBD. Um, specifically when there are functional symptoms. Uh, additionally, athletes that are experiencing GI distress, so like runner's diarrhea, uh, there is some evidence to show that the low FODMAP diet may be beneficial. And in celiac disease, when there's persistent symptoms despite adherence to a gluten-free diet. So I'm sure that there's going to be a lot more research to come. And we may find that the low FODMAP diet is helpful for many other conditions but the majority of the evidence does support the use of the low FODMAP diet with IBS. So before we really delve into everything, let's start by talking about what the low FODMAP diet is. So FODMAPs are short chain carbohydrates that are readily fermentable by a microbe, by our gut bacteria. And they can produce gas as a byproduct of this fermentation. There's also a bit of an osmotic effect. So there's water that gets drawn into the lumen of the intestine. This can lead to distension, abdominal pain, urgency, excessive flatulence, um, altered bowel habit, and the presence of visceral hypersensitivity, which is often seen in IBS patients. FODMAP is an acronym. It stands for fermentable, oligosaccharides, that refers to fructans, uh, which are found in onion, garlic, wheat, um, and galacto-oligosaccharides, or GOS, and those are often found in beans as well as other foods. D stands for disaccharides, that refers to lactose or the milk sugar. M stands for monosaccharides, that refers to fructose, commonly found in um, many fruits, for example, mango, also found in honey, um, and polyols, so 
sugar alcohols. And in particular with the low FODMAP diet, we are talking about sorbitol and mannitol, sorbitol being common in foods like avocado and blackberries, mannitol being common in foods like cauliflower and mushrooms. The low FODMAP diet has three distinct phases. And so just to give a brief overview of the low FODMAP diet, it's not a long-term elimination diet where you stay in this elimination phase forever and you never reintroduce foods. It's actually very important that you go through all three phases. So there's the elimination phase that will typically last about two to six weeks. And during this phase, there's strict elimination of high FODMAP foods. And you need to, as the healthcare practitioner, assess whether the patient experiences symptom improvement. Um, if there's compliance and the patient does not experience symptom improvement, chances are they're not very sensitive to FODMAP. So you would then, as I say, abort mission and you would not move forward with reintroduction. You would probably try a different intervention. Um, but assuming that there is symptom improvement, you would then move forward with the reintroduction phase. During this phase, you would systematically reintroduce each FODMAP using specific test foods that contain only that FODMAP. You would remain in the elimination phase for all foods other than the test food. That way you're not changing too many variables at once. And you would assess the patient's tolerance and interpret their reaction to each FODMAP and guide them through this process. This is arguably the most important part of the low FODMAP diet because you're really going to identify dietary triggers during this phase. And I always explain to the clients, it can be really scary because yes, some uh, high FODMAP foods that we'll be testing may trigger symptoms, but the idea is to really identify what they're sensitive to and what they're not. Then they can enter the maintenance or the personalization phase. During this part, you would be reintroducing well-tolerated FODMAP. So going back to those reintroductions, Depending on which FODMAPs were well tolerated, you can then bring those in and reincorporate them into the diet. And you can liberalize the diet and continue to assess symptom management. Um, I do usually encourage further food challenges in the future because it is possible that your sensitivity may change. And so even foods that you did react very strongly to, you would want to test that again, maybe six months down the line or however long and just see if you have a similar reaction or if you can perhaps tolerate more of that food. Even though the low FODMAP diet is very helpful and I use it a lot in my practice, there are some contraindications to executing the low FODMAP diet. So as a practitioner, I think it's really important to be able to recognize who's an appropriate candidate for this diet and who is not. Um, in general, young children, it's not recommended that they start the low FODMAP diet. Um, first, in terms of physical development, we really want to try to limit restrictions. Also, in terms of some psychological aspects, uh, putting them on a very restrictive diet may be um, not the best <laughs> thing to do. Of course, if there is um, guidance uh, with certain, with different healthcare practitioners, I guess it's not so black and white, but in general, young children, it's not advised. Um, if individuals are malnourished, we would again want to really focus on what we can add in and how we can nourish that individual before we start restricting foods from their diet. If there's poor feasibility, so whether that's due to um, financial access to perhaps a dietitian or a provider who can provide guidance, um, or foods, and or if someone's unwilling to follow the diet, then of course a low FODMAP diet is likely not going to be the best intervention for that person. Uh, individuals with many dietary restrictions. So this can vary. For example, if someone has celiac and needs to be gluten-free, I'm not too concerned about also doing a low FODMAP diet because while there are some caveats, the low FODMAP diet is mostly gluten-free. So that's not a major restriction um, to layer on top of another restriction. But if someone has multiple food allergies or their preferences are so minimal that you really are only going to be limited to a small amount of foods, again, it may not be the best intervention for that person. If there is an active eating disorder, the low FODMAP diet would be contraindicated. It is an elimination diet and we do not want to have any further restriction that person should be referred to an eating disorder specialist. 
and that should be the priority. Um, if there's a history of an eating disorder or a current disordered eating pattern, that's where it can get a little controversial. So it may not be the best option, but we are going to talk about some things that we can do, both dietary and non-dietary interventions that can potentially be helpful for that client. So I do wanna take a little bit of a closer look at disordered eating and eating disorders. So disordered eating patterns and eating disorders have been found to be more common in those with GI conditions compared to those without GI conditions. Um, disordered eating patterns have been found to range from about 5 to 44% in those with GI conditions. So yes, very broad range. Um, and eating disorders were found to range from 22 to 29% in those with GI conditions, compared to a prevalence of 10% in the control population. Uh, overt eating disorders are associated with functional gut disorders. So um, there's one study on the reference list that I cited. It's by Kate Scarlotta and Patsy Katsos. And they cited a study from University of Sydney where 98% of 101 female participants who admitted to having an eating disorder fit criteria for a functional GI disorder and 52% of those individuals specifically fit criteria for IBS. Um, I also wanna bring your attention to ARFID, which is Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder. This is a more newly recognized eating disorder. And while most of the research has been done in children, um, there was a large study, or at least the largest study to date, regarding the prevalence of ARFID in adult GI patients. And it showed that 19% of patients from an adult outpatient GI clinic screened positive for ARFID. And IBS patients were twice as likely as non-IBS patients to screen positive. Um, the bottom line is, if you work within the digestive health space, please be mindful of the fact that there is a strong overlap with disordered eating and eating disorders. And you do want to make sure that you are taking a thorough look at whether or not it's appropriate to be recommending an elimination diet. So why should we screen for eating disorders and look for disordered eating patterns in GI patients? Apart from what I just mentioned, <laughs> elimination diet should never be taken lightly. The FOLO FODMAP diet is extremely nuanced and restricts many foods. This can be triggering for many individuals. This can sometimes be used as a way to continue with restrictive eating. And as practitioners, we should really practice with the mantra, do no harm. So if you feel like this person restricting more foods is going to perhaps cause more harm, then again, it's not an appropriate intervention for that person. There are many other methods of IBS management that can be helpful. So what can you do if a patient is an inappropriate candidate for the low FODMAP diet, even if you feel like they really may benefit from it? So first we're going to talk about some dietary interventions. There's the FODMAP gentle approach, you can also take that a step further and cherry pick relevant FODMAPs. And you can also identify non-FODMAP dietary triggers. So we're gonna delve into this a little bit more. The FODMAP gentle approach is a newer method proposed as a way to modify the low FODMAP diet. So essentially, you don't pull out every high FODMAP food, but many of the common triggers or the foods that are highest in FODMAPs are removed. So this table shown here indicates what you might remove in a FODMAP gentle approach. So it's much smaller than the list that you would normally be confronted with with the full low FODMAP elimination diet. Um, it's really important also whenever you're doing well, even if you're doing a full low FODMAP diet, but whenever you're doing a modified approach, you really wanna help support the patient however you can. So I recommend including recommendations for low FODMAP brands and varieties of foods, such as the SHAR certified low FODMAP options, in order to provide options rather than just providing restrictions. So again, you wanna think about how you can make this easiest and more feasible for the patient. 
And you want to make sure that you're really trying to limit restrictions and think about giving them options. There can, of course, be further modifications. So as dietitians, we do a lot of individualized work with patients, and this is no different. So we want to aim to provide the least restrictive diet while maintaining symptom management. So how do we do that? We first want to take a thorough look at a dietary recall or diet history. And we want to ask about suspected trigger foods. Patients really have a good idea of what bothers them. <laughs> and so first start by listening to the patient and seeing what they say. Sometimes, of course, there can be some misassociations, but people generally have a good idea of when they eat a certain food, they don't feel well and we can connect the dots. So if you can identify a pattern, it's really helpful. For example, if a patient says onion, garlic, and wheat bother me, suspect that that patient is sensitive to fructans. If the patient says mango, pear, and honey bother me, suspect that they're sensitive to fructose. If you can identify a pattern, it will make it so you can hone in on which FODMAP or which FODMAPs are likely triggering those symptoms in that patient. And then instead of doing a full elimination diet, you would just pull out those FODMAPs. Um, another way that you could do this is go a step further and just pull out a few specific foods. For example, if during a dietary recall, it's very clear that someone is eating a lot of onions in their diet, just start there by eliminating onions without eliminating other foods, without even talking about FODMAP sometimes. Again, depending on how triggering that could be for the patient, you're there to help them feel better and to do no harm. So sometimes that may mean just pulling out one food or a couple specific foods and seeing if that can get them to symptom improvement. One thing to know is that if the patient is not eating a diet that's high in FODMAPs when you're doing a dietary recall, chances are, FODMAPs are not the issue. So again, you may not even want to go down a whole rabbit hole because it seems like those are probably not what's causing symptoms in that person. It's also important to look for non-FODMAP dietary triggers. So as I tell many of my patients, it's not always about the FODMAPs. And this is true whether we're doing a full low FODMAP elimination diet or a modified version or not even doing the low FODMAP diet. So one thing to look out for is fat. Large amounts of fat within one sitting can trigger discomfort, urgency, and oftentimes will exacerbate diarrhea. That's especially important in someone with IBSD. We tend to see that they're very sensitive to large portions of fat. Fiber is also something that you wanna look for. So fiber tolerance can vary greatly by individual. And I always explain to my patients that the low FODMAP diet in any form is not a low fiber diet, but the amount of fiber that someone can tolerate will really vary depending on the person. So first you can assess for high FODMAP prebiotic fibers like inulin, which can be present in foods. Inulin is often found in um, breads and bars. I've seen it in yogurts. And for the general population, it's not a bad thing. But if someone's very sensitive, it's very fermentable and it can trigger symptoms in people. Uh, one thing to know is that if someone is uh, choosing a lot of gluten-free items, inulin tends to be present in a lot of gluten-free items. So oftentimes that's a distinction when you are going over any sort of restriction with gluten um, in the context of either a full low FODMAP diet or a modified version, you would wanna make sure that you're teaching that patient how to read labels and what to look out for, that they're not just choosing any gluten-free food, but it needs to be suitable for the low FODMAP or a modified version, whatever you're carrying out with that patient. Um, you do want to also consider reducing insoluble fiber if needed and increasing soluble fiber or suitable sources of soluble fiber because soluble fiber can be a little bit more bowel regulating and is usually better tolerated. Of course, soluble fiber can also be found in many high FODMAP foods. So depending on the individual, you just wanna be cognizant of recommending suitable sources. So if we're talking about the low FODMAP diet, for example, things like papaya and potato and 
um, oats and, and things like that, that would likely be suitable. Alcohol can also be a trigger for a lot of people. And again, this doesn't really have to do with the FODMAPs. Many alcohol options are low FODMAP. There are, of course, some exceptions like rum. Um, but individuals can still be sensitive to alcohol. And so that's something to pay attention to as well. Caffeine can increase urgency. I think a lot of people are aware of the fact that caffeine can have an effect on the bowels. Um, some may be sensitive to the caffeine in coffee. There's also a thought that some may be sensitive to the acid in coffee. Um, one thing to know is you can, of course, try reducing someone's caffeine intake. And first of all, assess their caffeine intake because some people's caffeine intake is sky high, <laughs> and that could be a really big contributor. Um, and, and try to bring that down in a realistic way and work with the patient. Um, if the patient either doesn't want to try decaf or doesn't notice a difference when they switch to decaf, one thing that you can recommend is trying a low acid coffee variety. There is very limited research on this. Anecdotally, it often works well and there's very little risk. So in a scenario like that, again, very little risk, there's sort of no harm in trying, and a lot of people do very well with that. Um, spicy food tends to be a little bit of an irritant and can be bothersome. Um, and carbonated beverages, so again, oftentimes it's not always a FODMAP issue, although there can certainly be FODMAPs in certain carbonated beverages, but the carbonation itself uh, tends to worsen bloating. So again, you really want to review any dietary recall or any subsequent food and symptom journals that the patient may be keeping. You want to review that closely in order to identify whether these non-FODMAP dietary triggers are likely worsening symptoms in your patient. And starting there can really limit the restrictions compared to doing a full low FODMAP elimination diet. So, we're gonna talk a little bit about non-dietary interventions now, and there are quite a few. One thing to know about these non-dietary interventions is they can be carried out uh, by the dietitian, some of them, but some of them cannot be <laughs> and may need to be carried out by other practitioners. This highlights the importance of a multidisciplinary team, especially with a multifactorial condition like IBS. Another thing to know is that many of these can be used, uh, yes, possibly as an alternative, but also in conjunction with other options. And so it's really great to piece these together as you're working with the patient and see what would benefit the patient most and how you can use different pieces of this puzzle to actually manage their IBS effectively, again, even without a full low FODMAP elimination diet. So, for medications, I'm going to start by saying, uh, as dietitians, we obviously do not prescribe medications, so I'm not going to do a deep dive into this, but I do think it's very important for uh, you to be knowledgeable of some of the medications that may be used with IBS so that you're familiar with these medications. Um, medications, of course, can be prescribed by the gastroenterologist or by the primary care physician. Side effects must be considered there are many medication options. So I put here some examples of some of the medication classes commonly used and some of the, um, the brand names of those medications so that you can start to recognize these medications when you're reviewing patient intake forms or if you're working with a patient if their plan of care changes and they start any new medication. Also, I think it's really important to be able to have a conversation with the gastroenterologist and perhaps even suggest recommending a medication if you feel that someone is not an appropriate candidate for the low FODMAP diet. Because the low FODMAP diet is a first line therapy at this point, oftentimes it will be recommended even before medication. And again, as a dietitian, it's really up to you to assess is that appropriate or not. And if not, having that communication with the gastroenterologist is really key and being knowledgeable about some of these medications and the fact that they exist <laughs> is very helpful. So for example, um, chloride channel activators such as amatiza, antibiotics such as zyfaxin, um, uh, there's a lot of different medications obviously, I'm just highlighting some of the very uh, 
common ones, but this doesn't mean this is an exhaustive list by any means. Uh, tricyclic antidepressants, that would be like Elevil, um, SSRIs, SNRIs, new opioid receptor agonists like Viberzy, uh, the guanolate, spiclase C agonists like Linzess. Again, these are really common medications, depending on the IBS subtype that your patient may be taking or that you may wanna consider having a conversation with the gastroenterologist about. Uh, supplements are something that we could be recommending as dietitians. They're oftentimes over the counter. And again, it's really helpful to at least be familiar with which supplements can potentially be of help, depending on what's going on with the patient. So, um, Peppermint oil acts as an antispasmodic and can reduce abdominal pain. Many patients do find it to be very helpful. Uh, some people will take it regularly when it comes to IBS. Some people will only take it as needed, or it may be part of their emergency toolkit. If they, um, for example, eat something that they know is a dietary trigger, they can use this as a tool to help alleviate the pain. Uh, magnesium can be helpful for constipation in particular. Typically, magnesium citrate would be used. It can have a laxative effect in particular when it's in excess of about 400 milligrams. So you might want to start around there and then increase the amount as needed. Um, soluble fiber can be helpful for both diarrhea and constipation, which I always explain to patients is really interesting and kind of cool uh, because most uh, therapies, for one, sometimes have the risk of worsening the other. Um, so soluble fiber is very bell regulating and you do wanna make sure that you would talk to the patient about uh, hydration whenever they're taking a soluble fiber supplement because soluble fiber, when you uh, take a bunch without uh, enough water, sometimes can make you feel like you just ate a brick. So um, it works well with water and you wanna make sure that you are talking to them about hydration with any soluble fiber supplement. These would be, for example, um, Metamucil or uh, Benafiber or Citrusel, all of those would be soluble fiber supplements. Um, for enzymes, you can certainly recommend including certain enzymes as a means of uh, not restricting their diet and increasing the tolerance to foods. So for example, lactate, which is the lactase enzyme, can be used uh, so that they don't need to eliminate lactose from their diet. And beanzyme or beano can be used for um, the GOS, so that's the alpha-galactosidase enzyme. And again, this would be really helpful for someone who maybe eats a lot of um, beans or is vegetarian or vegan. And again, you really just don't want to restrict their diet too much. So you may consider including this enzyme and see if that helps to provide some comfort without actually removing the food. Um, Gut-directed hypnotherapy, of course, would not be carried out by the dietitian. So you would need to consider when to refer out for something like this. It's typically carried out by a therapist. Um, it uses imagery in order to promote relaxation within the gut while in a state of hypnosis. It's usually a series of sessions. This is really becoming more of a hot topic. Um, I suspect that there will be a lot more research on this in the coming years. But a review of the available literature demonstrated that there was definitely a broad uh, range of a response rate, 24 to 73%. But long-term efficacy was maintained in four out of the five studies reviewed. And a recent randomized controlled trial demonstrated gut-directed hypnotherapy to be as effective as the low FODMAP diet in the management of IBS symptoms. It also demonstrated superior psychological improvements compared to dietary intervention. That's really important because for someone who is not an appropriate candidate for the low FODMAP diet, again, it's, it's one study. But it was a pretty strong study, and it did show that um, the gut-directed hypnotherapy was as effective as the low FODMAP diet. So it's a really plausible option for someone when the low FODMAP diet is not an option. Oh, and I, I should mention that um, you can find trained gut-directed hypnosis professionals at ibshypnosis.com. So if you're unsure where to refer to, 
that's a helpful tip. You can go to ibshypnosis.com and there's a directory listed by state. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy has been around for a while, CBT. This is also carried out by a therapist. So again, as dietitians, we're not doing cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, but the aim is to increase awareness of negative thoughts and restructure the thought process. In IBS specifically, this would be used to alter the perceived IBS experience. Um, so for example, if someone has a lot of uh, stress around symptoms and maybe eating and how it will affect their symptoms, the therapist would work with the patient in order to alter that experience and really try to increase awareness of those negative thoughts so that that thought process can be totally changed. And we know that IBS is um, a disorder of that gut-brain interaction. So there, there is good research to support using CBT with IBS patients. Um, Something that I actually thought was really cool to include in our times now, now in the world of telehealth and, and virtual everything, is a recent randomized control uh, trial demonstrated that minimal contact CBT, um, and that was described as the patient didn't meet with the therapist as much as they typically would. They were given some at-home direction and exercises to do after minimal meetings with the therapist. Um, this yielded significant IBS symptom improvement compared to education alone and yielded as significant IBS symptom improvement compared to standard CBT. So I thought that was really cool because it limits the barriers to CBT, most notably cost, uh, time, and access to a therapist. So in the world of telehealth and, and virtual everything, um, this is becoming most likely increasingly a great option for those with IBS, again, in conjunction with the low FODMAP diet or modified version, or perhaps in lieu of it. Movement and exercise is also really important to discuss. So movement can play a significant role in GI symptom management. In particular, low impact, low intensity activity oftentimes is helpful. What that means is walking, um, perhaps yoga, Pilates, bar, all of these workouts tend to be very well tolerated by those with IBS and may actually help to improve symptoms. Um, on the other hand, high impact, high intensity activity can sometimes exacerbate symptoms. So what we mean by that is running, high intensity interval training, boot camp style classes, um, these activities tend to exacerbate symptoms. Something to know is this is not necessarily true for everyone. Again, there's really no one size fits all approach here. Um, so if you're working with a serious runner, you don't have to recommend <laughs> right away that they just stop running. But maybe they can include more of that low impact, low intensity activity. Maybe they can take note of how they feel. Do they feel different when they do, I don't know, a, eight mile run or when they do a boot camp class compared to when they do yoga or a walk? How do their symptoms respond to each of those activities? And again, really tailor the intervention to the patient. Meal spacing and meal hygiene is really important and often overlooked. So one important note is you definitely want to help the patient to avoid getting overly hungry or overly full. So helping them to tune into hunger and fullness cues can be really important because usually in both cases, IBS symptoms can be exacerbated. You also want to talk to the patient about spacing meals a few hours apart. So ideally about three to four hours apart. This can allow for this motility wave called the migrating motor complex or MMC to actually be initiated. Um, now that only happens in more of a fasted state. And by fasted, we don't necessarily mean that you're not eating all day, but giving yourself a few hours for many people, it may be two to three hours, it could be a little more to allow that motility wave to actually occur. Um, additionally, allowing some time between meals and snacks and not just grazing all day can help to prevent FODMAP stacking, which I always say, I don't love that term. I always tell my patients it's sort of a 
a way to make a complicated diet even more complicated. <laughs> but um, FODMAP stacking is something that you could be concerned about if someone's going to be grazing throughout the day. And this is especially important if you're not doing a full low FODMAP elimination because we know that there are high FODMAP foods lingering in that diet. And so if they're going to be grazing throughout the day, it's more likely that they're going to be really increasing that FODMAP load. And again, it may make it so that more of those foods are not well tolerated. The goal here is to increase tolerance and liberalize the diet instead of having that patient not feel well and then say, oh, now I can't eat X, Y, Z foods either. Um, this makes eating regular balanced meals even more important. So while you're working with this patient, you definitely want to make sure that you're going over the components of a balanced plate, uh, basic principles of blood sugar management, so that again, since they're going a little longer between eating, they're satisfied, they have uh, high energy levels, and they're not crashing. Uh, you can also practice some deep breathing exercises, and in particular, if you have the patient do this prior to eating, it can potentially help to activate that parasympathetic nervous system, which can be helpful. So I'm sure many of you know that the sympathetic nervous system is that fight or flight response. Um, and the parasympathetic nervous system is that rest and digest system. So ideally, we want to set ourselves up to be in a proper environment for digestion. So doing some deep breathing for a minute or two before the meal can actually help that person potentially to um, tolerate their food better. I also like to explain to my patients that digestion begins with chewing, as many of us know. Um, so you really wanna recommend that they're chewing their food thoroughly. So really chewing to like an applesauce consistency, um, making sure that not only are you breaking down that food mechanically, right, as you're taking bites, but you're also giving time for that um, that bolus of food to mix with our saliva, which has enzymes. So it's really twofold and you wanna make sure that they're not eating too quickly so that that can happen. You also want to improve mindfulness surrounding meals. So again, this really goes back to tuning into their own body. Um, you want to set aside time to sit down and enjoy the meal, no eating on the go, standing up in the car. Um, limiting distractions, so really trying to limit phone, TV, doing work, scrolling through emails while eating, focusing on the taste, the texture, and the satisfaction of food and how that food makes them feel. And again, as I mentioned before, paying attention to hunger and fullness cues. So meal spacing and meal hygiene can play a really big role in symptoms for many patients. And again, you're not even touching the diet here. So this is a great option for someone where dietary intervention is not appropriate. Um, and sleep hygiene and stress management. So uh, research suggests that there's an association between poor sleep quality and IBS symptoms. And I will say I have definitely seen this in my patients a lot. So one thing you can do is you can establish a routine in order to help manage IBS symptoms. I always say IBS loves routine. So when we get thrown off from our routine, sometimes symptoms can sort of go awry. Um, one thing you can do in order to establish a routine is set a consistent bedtime and wake time, and then taking it a step further and really trying to come up with a routine for nighttime and morning. So for example, maybe for that patient, you recommend that they um, avoid blue light, so they're not going on their phone, scrolling through social media or texting people or emailing work. Um, they're not watching TV. And you're really trying to limit that uh, blue light about one hour before bed. And maybe they take a shower and read a book and that's their nighttime routine. There's some research to show that the blue light can interfere with our circadian rhythm. So you're really working there to improve sleep quality. Um, and get them to have a wind down routine. So they're sort of telling their body, okay, work is done, <laughs> I'm relaxing, I'm going to sleep for the night and really trying to get, get into that more um, relaxed state. And then establishing a morning routine. So trying to keep more of a consistent wake time, 
maybe that person does some guided meditation in the morning, maybe they just wake up and take a shower, whatever it might be, but something that's consistent. Um, you also want to make sure that you identify stressors and discuss ways to manage stress. And that's really going to be different for different people. So keeping a journal, whether it's an expressive writing journal or a gratitude journal can be really helpful for many clients. Doing meditation or guided meditation, there are many apps that can help with that. For example, Headspace or Calm or Insight Timer. All of these are wonderful tools that you can bring in. Um, exercise, whether it's that they take a walk, whether they incorporate yoga, whatever it might be, taking a bath, reading a book, doing adult coloring books or crossword or word search puzzles. Um, again, different things are going to work for different people. So you really want to work with the patient and see what would work best for them and set a few specific goals to get started. That way you can really start talking more about stress management sleep hygiene, and how this can impact um, IBS symptoms. So I know we talked about a lot today. As I mentioned, there are a lot of different methods of IBS management. But in terms of putting it all together, some pearls that I want to leave you with. Dietary intervention is not appropriate for every person. And as dietitians, I know that can be really difficult sometimes. But not every person is going to be the best candidate for dietary intervention. Screening should be conducted by the healthcare provider in order to assess the appropriateness of the candidate for the dietary intervention. And you can consider whether a modified approach may be appropriate or if diet therapy is completely contraindicated. When dietary intervention is inappropriate, there are many other methods of IBS symptom management, and the goal here should really be to improve the patient's quality of life. So as the provider, you should really be asking yourself, if this person is going to be potentially further harmed by a restrictive elimination diet, perhaps that's not the best option. What would be other options that can really help to improve their quality of life? Um, and also remember, IBS is multifactorial. And oftentimes the best approach may be a combination of many different interventions. So again, you wanna consider as a provider, how can you best support that patient? That may mean referring them to someone else, whether it's a referral to a therapist for gut-directed hypnotherapy, whether it's communication with a gastroenterologist to discuss potential medication use, um, whether it's recommending a supplement, uh, maybe you do pursue a dietary intervention, but if so, which one? Do you modify it? And if so, how are you modifying it? So really think about how you can best support the patient in order to improve their quality of life, improve their symptoms, and maintain symptom management without causing any harm. So we have some time for questions, and I have my contact information up there. Um, I don't know if Megan, oh, there you are. <laughs> um, thank you so much for this, Alyssa. I'm going to ask the first question. So someone has a question about Citrocell. Is this type of soluble fiber something you would recommend to take daily to help with bowel regulation or only as needed? So usually for soluble fiber, and it really doesn't matter which one, which brand in particular you're recommending, um, uh, well, it, it does if they include some high FODMAP ingredients, but in particular, um, I don't want you so focused on citrus cell, but any soluble fiber supplement, uh, it could be taken daily. So that's not a concern. Some people may find they don't need to take it when they start doing some other interventions. Some people do. Okay. Um, someone's asking about peppermint oil. Which one do you recommend? I usually recommend IB Guard. And oftentimes the gastroenterologists have samples of this. Um, and so the patient can try it out and see if it's working for them. Um, it, it seems to be very helpful in many patients. Again, not a one size fits all, but it does tend to work very well. Mm -hmm. um, I sort of have a, a question. It might be a little bit of a longer question, but from your perspective, um, do you find that people are really willing, to, like, is, is, do, when people, someone has IBS, do you find that they're coming in with, you know, a really restrictive diet as is, and you kind of have to talk them out of restrictions, or how do you manage that? Yeah, that's a great question. 
Um, so a lot of people come to me already eliminating so many foods, many of which they may not need to eliminate. Um, and yeah, when we do even a full low FODMAP elimination diet, we're bringing foods in, which I know can be very hard to believe, but it happens all the time. Um, I do think people get very focused on diet and while dietary triggers are common in IBS, again, as we've discussed, not the only reason someone may be exhibiting symptoms. Um, I think setting some realistic expectations is really important and saying, okay, look, it's not just that when you eat something, you're going to have the symptom. It could be related to stress. Is there a lot going on at work? Um, look at 2020. <laughs> it's been a stressful year. Um, you really want to look at other potential triggers are because when people hone in so much on diet, then they think, oh, I used to eat this all the time and now I had symptoms after I ate it and now I can't eat it. And that's not necessarily true. So you should be setting some realistic expectations that this is a chronic condition. It's managed, it's not cured, every day will not be perfect. Um, but how can we best manage it for you? And that may mean actually taking a look at some of those other factors, not just diet. Um, in, order, in order to do that, there is sometimes some resistance, but usually as we work together, people will start to see that themselves and my favorite part is when uh, patients will start to say, you know what, I had, I had a little bit of a about during the time between last session now, but I had a really, really stressful day the day before and I still woke up stressed and I think that had to do with it. Because that shows me that they're really tuning in and they're really seeing that it's not just diet. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, a question about eating disorder screening tools. Is there any that you usually use or recommend? So you can use the nine item ARFID screen, NIAS. Um, to be honest, many of these screening tools are not necessarily um, validated in the IBS population specifically. And so what I often do in my practice is I ask questions. I ask the patient, do you have a history of an eating disorder? Is there a chance that they may not tell the truth? Possibly, but usually they're there for help. So I usually ask point blank, is there a history of an eating disorder? And then in asking really pointed questions, I'm also learning about, does this person have disordered eating patterns? Um, I'm asking about food beliefs that they might harbor. Um, you can go through a recall and sometimes people will offer up a lot of information so you can kind of learn a little bit about their beliefs that way and as a pr practitioner it's really your call with is this person an appropriate person to be putting on an elimination diet um, is talking about restrictions going to be triggering and and really piecing that together and if you're unsure um, because therapists can be so important in the management of IBS, it can be very helpful to refer to a therapist and have them work with a therapist concurrently if you're suspecting strong disordered eating patterns. Yeah, and that reminds me, um, can you send the link to me um, with the, the link to the therapist, the gut? The oh gut yeah, it's ibshypnosis.com, yeah. but I'll send it. Because I think that would be good to share with everyone. Yeah, it's a helpful tool. Um, okay, someone's asking more about peppermint oil. Um, do you do ingested or topical? And then following that, um, like there's the droplets and the pills. So what's your... Usually it's um, the ingested would work. I, well, people do say the topical helps, but most of the evidence does seem to be for the ingested peppermint oil and it should be enteric coated so that it really acts in the um, intestine. Mm -hmm. Okay, someone's asking for your advice on food allergy and sensitivity testing. For my research, I found these to be unreliable. However, I have patients come to me with many allergies and intolerances, and they refuse to challenge them to assess tolerance. So how do you navigate that? That can be really tricky. I, I get patients that come to me all the time with stacks of <laughs> tests, um, and we know that the evidence for many of these tests is not strong. Um, so it's really important to work with the patient here. You really want to avoid coming across as harsh or like you're not listening to them because that's probably not true, but that's how it can come across if you start saying, okay, I'm not looking at this, this isn't relevant. Um, you really wanna read through it and you wanna consider, okay, well, let's see out of these, what are some things that we can agree on? For example, is it showing some reaction to 
onion. Okay, we're gonna pull out onion anyway. <laughs> or um, you really wanna make sure that you get on the same page as the client and, and build their trust. And then from there, if they are open to bringing in some foods, oftentimes what I find is patients who come to me with these tests have been on such restrictive diets for so long and they are so ready to be done with it. So if you can explain the science behind it and say, look, we don't, there's no evidence here of an anaphylactic allergy. It's safe to try this food. How do you feel about bringing in a small portion and seeing how you feel? Um, most often people are very amenable to that and they're happy to be liberalizing their diet. I can't speak for everyone, of course. Um, but I think starting there, you can really start to build the client's trust and then they can see what they're sensitive to, what they're not, and get off of that restrictive diet, which is usually why they've come to you in the first place. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay. I actually think that is all the questions. So thank you so much. Um, just as a reminder to everyone, I will be sending out your certificates, any handouts, any links that Alyssa mentioned, her contact information. So you will have a lengthy email from me probably tomorrow morning. Um, this was so great. Thank you so much for working with us on this awesome presentation. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>